Greetings. I'm Carl Brown of CIEE, and I would like to welcome you to Sahar Jadai Hall at UC Berkeley for the Spring 2013 Eye for Energy Seminar Series. Welcome to those attending the web viewing at our other Citrus campuses, Davis, Merced, and Santa Cruz, as well as those logged in to the webinar. Today, we are fortunate to host John Elliott, Chief Sustainability Officer at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Chief Sustainability Officer, how about that? Sustainability in the executive suite. The other UC campuses have sustainability directors, but UCLA is the only other UC campus with a CSO. I hope this is a strong trend. My notes about John start with his previous position at, at UC Merced. Uh, when I met John back in 2006, we had put into place a strong energy efficiency plan for the new 10th campus. We had opened the first buildings, which John eventually helped us measure out to be better than the trajectory we had plotted. I clearly remember the UC Merced chief of plant showing me John's resume. The chief knew he needed an energy manager, but was unsure if John was the right fit. I took a look and saw a degree from the UC Berkeley Energy and Resources Group, and then some good experience with an energy software company. I let the chief know a gem had just fallen into his lap, and that he should interview John immediately and do his best to not let him get away. John spent the next six years as Director of Energy and Sustainability, implementing the UC Merced Energy Plan and helping the campus raise the bar by setting a triple zero goal for 2020. Zero net energy, zero scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions, and zero landfill waste. For these efforts, John and his UC Merced colleague, Jim Janis, were honored as the University of California Sustainability Champions for 2012. John came to Berkeley Lab a year ago, which brings us to his talk today. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to CSO John Elliott. Great, thank you very much, Carl, for that kind introduction. Um, as Carl mentioned, I've been Chief Sustainability Officer at Berkeley Lab for a relatively short amount of time. I came in June of last year, but long enough to have developed um, priorities and initiatives and to begin making some progress in different areas. So I'd like to share with you that direction today in the form of a Berkeley Lab sustainability strategy um, today. So um, first, I'd like to step back um, for a little context and remind us, or at least give you my take on, on why we're here, why we're talking about sustainability, uh, why Berkeley Lab has a chief sustainability officer. And the short answer is climate change. Um, and so climate change, it's um, a problem clearly of global proportions and um, that um, is fundamentally a threat to civilization. Um, if you look here, I've plotted a few different trends that characterize climate change. Um, and this plot here is uh, the root cause of climate change, human um, fossil fuel and cement uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this plot starts here in 1990, early 90s. I was just graduating from college. Uh, we had the Rio Earth Summit for serious discussions about setting public policy targets for climate change. And as we know, um, the emissions trajectory has continued to go up over time, um, up to the most recent data, um, with emissions now at 50, more than 50% higher than they were in 1990. So um, our climate scientists will continue to do research and continue to tease out the complicated overlapping positive and negative feedbacks and, and um, give us better estimates of where we're likely to end up in a particular year. But generally, you can say, you know, with this trajectory, we're uh, far surpassing any reasonably proposed policy target in the area of climate. If you look at um, key impacts um, that, that end up having effects all over the globe, um, the data uh, on Arctic sea ice extent 
um, the data that came in last fall um, showed a new minimum, um, almost 20% below the previous minimum there. And if you compare it to sort of longer term averages, um, about 50% less than the longer term averages and well outside the variability of what's been seen. And then we've also gotten um, uh, more data and better detail characterizing the complicated ways in which we experience climate change. So more extremes in temperature over time. So this is a plot from, um, from Hansen uh, from last year in which they looked at um, temperature anomalies, a distribution of temperature anomalies, and they um, characterized a baseline distribution of anomalies, hot and cold extremes, and then plotted here the month, uh, and decadal shift in the distribution in comparison to that baseline. And you see this marching towards the right, so that means more high temperature events. And um, it's somewhat disconcerting. You see this shift, it's moved over one standard deviation. So events that were occurring only 16% of the time that were less likely have now moved to the center and are um, defining the norm. And they estimate in this paper that if you follow business as usual emissions over a 50-year period, then this distribution moves out and it centers over the third standard deviation. So in other words, events that occurred um, very infrequently, the very end of the tail, a tenth of a percent of the time, have now become or would now become the norm. Um, so as we look about doing something about climate change, climate change mitigation, um, uh, the work that, that I'm doing, um, there are some particular challenges here. Um, and one is that climate impacts are largely irreversible over the time scale of human societies. So this is a plot from Susan Solomon at NOAA. Um, and these were models um, uh, looking at global emissions, but in which they would go up with a trajectory up to a certain uh, emissions um, concentration and then drop emissions down to zero. And what you see is, yes, the concentration of CO2 over a long time scale, this is a thousand year axis here, um, do reduce over time, but because of um, long time scale mixing, the actual impacts of climate change, like surface warming, um, are actually quite consistent over time. So this means um, that you can't really drive right up to the brink and then back up and have everything recede. It's in effect that if you go up to the brink and then you cut your emissions down to zero, you're still going to be in and around that brink <laughs> for the next thousand plus years, um, so for generations to come. So that's a particular challenge. That means you're not talking about just the emissions rate that's occurring each year, but you're really talking about the total amount of greenhouse gases or the total amount of CO2 that gets out in the atmosphere, um, and that's what's driving the effect. And as you apply this to sort of looking at infrastructure, you find that um, small delays make mitigation much more difficult and much more expensive. So this is an idealized plot. It's now, um, I think this was done uh, by climate scientists, Copenhagen Diagnosis in 2009. And this is a plot that's pointing, um, plotting out an emissions trajectory um, associated with one of the most common policy targets that's discussed. So keeping warming under two degrees, that's looking somewhat quaint now. But you can think of it as, you know, this is the total amount, this area under the curve, the total amount of CO2 that can go out or greenhouse gases that go out um, and um, to keep you under a particular target. And so these are just small delays. This is 2011 up to 2020. And if you delay, in other words, if you choose to put in infrastructure that has significant carbon emissions, like a coal plant or a national gas plant, those emissions actually are baked into the infrastructure for many decades to come over the useful life of, of those, those infrastructure items. That means that your next decision, you have to do something more effective to keep your overall amount of, of CO2 under a certain level. So you can see just ideally here, or just in this idealized plot, that in order to stay under this policy target here, if you take action, significant action in 2011, this is a, a, about a 3 to 4% reduction per year in your emissions rate. And if you wait just nine years, you're talking about a much harder job, 9% um, reductions per year. Um, so uh, it sounds daunting, and it is daunting. Here's a, here's a plot or, or a picture um, from Jim Williams, uh, who's local here, and others in science. And they looked at a, um, a sort of 
detailed um, economy model, just looking at California and looking at what's required to meet the policy targets that we've put in place in California. So these are the 80% um, below 1990 levels by 2050. And I think they uh, characterize it well. They're talking about three big transformations that are needed, um, big transformations that are needed, and they all need to happen at the same time. One, a transformation in energy efficiency, where we're significantly improving our efficiency and use, um, you know, something on the order to uh, 40 to 50%, where we're um, substantially um, decarbonizing the electricity grid down to very little, and that's not enough. You actually have to change the structure of the economy, and you have to move a lot of the end uses that um, rely on fuels now, and you have to move them over to the electricity grid. So instead of end uses being, or electricity serving about 15% of the end uses, you're talking about moving that up to something like 55%. So big transformations, a big change in business as usual. And then remember, too, that climate isn't our only sustainability problem. Um, we have others. <laughs> um, there's generally, as sustainability practitioners, I'm looking at Lisa here, um, we generally tend to work in many different areas, about you know, 10 different areas. Um, this is um, something that I go back to as a published paper in Nature from, from a few years ago, where they're looking at um, environmental sustainability, not getting into social and economic sustainability too, but sort of used a consistent approach of looking at a whole bunch of different uh, environmental systems, global environmental systems, and they, they used an approach to identify a healthful boundary, um, a sustainability boundary. And at that time, they put forth that, you know, not only had we crossed a climate, um, a climate sustainability boundary, but also one in the area of biodiversity, and then one as well having to do with agricultural systems, the nitrogen cycle. And then also identified other areas where that we hadn't really fully yet quantified, but they sort of put in as placeholders within this system. Great. So um, where does that leave us? Hopefully you don't uh, feel um, depressed from what I've showed you, but energized. And um, our organizations like Berkeley Lab and UC Berkeley um, are energized by problems, and they're um, very unique institutions. They're unique institutions that have a very strong interest in sustainability, um, a lot of capability, um, creating new knowledge in the area of sustainability, significant um, uh, operations, uh, facilities departments, they're great places to pilot solutions and, um, and learn new ways of doing things and to really get ready for the coming regulatory environment that started here in California but has been going to become um, much more significant over the years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so it's not just me that thinks this. Um, <clears throat> the President of the United States also thinks this. Um, <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> the President, uh, by executive order, has laid out uh, many sustainability requirements <clears throat> that we, as a contractor to the Department of Energy, are required to follow. <clears throat> and incidentally, as well, we, as, um, as being operated by the UC system, are also uh, subject to the policy on sustainability standards that, that all of the UC campuses follow. Um, those policies are similar, um, uh, similar in magnitude, but different in most every detail. But you can get a feel from just looking at this list. These goals are um, quite aggressive, and they signal uh, a change in business as usual. I mean, this is talking about um, on the order of 30% um, energy reductions over a period of 10 uh, or so years, um, reductions in emissions, emissions associated with transportation, um, increasing use of renewable energy, um, phasing out of fossil fuel energy use in buildings and working towards zero net energy buildings um, designed after 2020, and then other ones related to reducing footprint um, in water and waste and so forth. <clears throat> so it's not that we, I mean, I think we have uh, this list of goals is a, is a really good start, gets us headed definitely in the right direction. It doesn't express all that needs to be done, but we sort of know where we're heading. But how, you know, as an organization, as a mature organization, do you really change business as usual? You know, these are significant changes to business as usual to meet these targets that are out there 10 and 20 years in the future. And that's really the job of strategy. Um, it's a strategy that needs to be 
um, customized and needs to really work for a particular organization. And it needs to be guided so that you can figure out what you should focus your time on and what you should not focus your time on, because there's a lot to do. And we tend to um, not uh, have um, that much time. <laughs> um, so this is the way um, I think of sustainability at the lab uh, that works for the lab. So we build on our strengths, um, extending our leadership in sustainability-related research to the sustainability of our operations. Um, this is a continuous improvement process that's guided by feedback. Um, and I would guide anything that we do by three goals. In other words, anything that we do should be able to support all these three goals simultaneously and get better over time. That is, we need to reduce our footprint. We need to be effective in reducing our footprint and know that we're actually reducing our footprint. So reducing the energy waste and water footprint uh, to levels that can be sustained indefinitely. We need to cultivate a living lab cultivate collaboration with what we do best, um, with you know, six to 700 researchers that just focus on efficiency and technologies and buildings and the many more researchers that are involved in Carbon Cycle 2.0, um, sustainability-related research at the lab. So I think of that as leveraging our operating infrastructure and these goals to support apply and strengthen research. And then as well, we need to think about the organization, institutionalizing sustainability, engaging staff, and really improving processes of any type to make sustainability part of what we're doing every day. So with these goals in mind, I have defined um, seven different initiatives. And, um, and these kind of fall into two areas. You know, one I think of as a series of infrastructure initiatives. Um, these are initiatives that work towards higher performing buildings with better feedback, substantially lower research con resource consumption. Um, and um, I've called these initiatives, you know, this is working on building better buildings, doing deep energy efficiency retrofits, doing performance monitoring to make sure that we capture and can maintain any savings that we create, and then also doing green grids or building better access to renewable energy. So strategies that have to do with new construction, retrofits, uh, monitoring, and also renewables. And then we have another set of initiatives that are focused more on people. Um, so developing engaged partnerships with staff to advance sustainability. Um, and these involve um, currently uh, electric vehicles, getting ready for one of those big trans transitions, um, moving um, uh, 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 transportation over to the electricity side, um, engaging employees around specific activities uh, that allow them to better relate to their infrastructure, to their buildings, and then also working on significantly improving um, waste reduction, um, diverting waste from the landfill to compost and recycling. This is um, solid waste reduction. Um, so I'm going to go through and explain just a little bit about the approach and diff different, um, each of these different initiatives. I'm going to take a little data detour for two slides um, uh, just to point out here that um, clearly the strategy that we're following is focused on buildings um, and or at least emphasizes buildings. And I would say that's reasonable uh, because buildings account for 70% of the lab's greenhouse gas emissions or at least the greenhouse gas emissions that are typically reported by standard protocols nowadays. Um, but of course, you know, clearly transportation there is also a significant part, so you can't forget that either. The next thing I would point out is that um, these are not just sort of qualitative initiatives. I have um, played around with a lot of the numbers and um, have developed reasonable uh, quantitative targets associated with many of these initiatives, certainly the building um, associated initiatives. So um, you could think of this as a thought exercise. It's a way to sort of identify targets for these particular programs. It's a way to get sense of what the priorities are. But um, I developed this plot by sort of looking, getting a list of all the buildings, our current building stock. We know the utility and energy usage of all those buildings. You know, you sort them, put the highest ones first and uh, sort them, and then go through and um, essentially assign a strategy to each one of the buildings. So you might say, well, this program we know is going to move. It's going to move into a new building. So let's focus for this one on building a new, better building, and then we'll move that program over. Another one, you say, well, this building and this program are going to be here for a long time. Let's focus on getting retrofits that we can maintain over time. 
and so forth. And then, so this is um, sort of efficiency strategies here, and then um, some of the renewable strategies, both on-site generation and, and off-site purchases of power. And you can see a few things, I think, just sort of looking at these numbers generally, um, and that is that there's no one silver bullet. You need to focus on all of these things in order to succeed. This is actually a plot here, um, as I said, a, a kind of just setting targets on what does it look like to eliminate the climate footprint from the existing building stock. See, no one silver bullet. And you see that it may be reasonable to target over a 50% elimination of that climate footprint. But then we still need to figure out new ways, new ways to cost effectively sort of get the rest of the way there, that remaining 44% on this plot. And then another thing to remind yourself, this is all expressed as percentage contribution to eliminating climate footprint, but you know, there are also numbers behind all of these. So these all require investments to do, but luckily um, some of these activities like efficiency and doing better buildings do um, generate savings over time. So it allows you to sort of build up a business model and um, over time to, to motivate all of this. Okay, so let's um, go through um, these initiatives. So the first is around better buildings. So the idea here, you know, first I, I might mention for all these initiatives, I'm really not going to focus on past achievements of the lab, but clearly the lab has been working on this. They've been working on this for years before I came. Um, and uh, they've made many great advances. You know, here's a picture of some, a new building, uh, 15, at, at the site, where they really paid a lot of attention to making this a better performing building, um, energy performance, and, and lead performance. But you know, this is strategy. So we're talking about you know, how we do things better. So that's mostly what I'm going to focus on, just a reminder. Um, so the idea here um, is, is really not to focus on, um, for the time being, on uh, getting more money. We actually do have very constrained budgets for our buildings, but really encouraging integrated high value design and setting sustainability targets at a, at a high level that really balance all of the objectives we have. Complicated science objectives for our buildings. Uh, we want to get very, um, achieve a very aggressive efficiency targets um, and also do so within a limited budget. So the idea here is to set targets um, get a design team, ideally set these targets before you even hire a design team so that they're working out innovative ways um, to make decisions early in the design process so that you can achieve these targets with low cost. So, you know, a good example of this is if you know you have to meet uh, an energy budget for this building and you've, you've defined it, you know, way early in the process, you can actually talk to each other and you can make a decision, for instance, well, we could orient the building a different way that reduces energy consumption, let's say, by 40% in the building. You know, that's a really cheap way, if you've, if you've done it uh, that way, to reduce your energy use. So that would be a good, a good way to think about it. Um, so we've had a committee and a working group. Uh, the committee was convened by our laboratory director in the fall, and we've been working through and have developed a particular policy to establish policy and process around this. Um, right now, uh, that uh, policy is going through an external, external review process right now uh, with sort of experts um, from across the country. Um, but uh, I just want to give you a flavor. I've sort of pulled out and annotated some of the pieces of the policy. This is a document that just fits, um, you know, the actual policy elements are just in a few pages. But they're, um, you know, trying to convey sustainability targets for the design team. Um, here are some of the uh, energy-related ones. and. You know, one of the basic ideas here is if we're trying to get um, uh, uh, high efficiency, low energy use, that we be very explicit about that. Instead of asking the design team, you know, can you just do a little bit better than you normally do? You say, you know, can you hit this target that you've worked out uh, for similar building types? Um, and that's really what can encourage this integrated design. You know, we're asking um, uh, design teams to really Think about the real environment in which you're designing a building, not uh, sort of the generic environment. Here we're in an extremely mild climate, and you can actually do a lot of space conditioning with the outside air that's there. But um, often mechanical engineers don't take advantage of that. Often these solutions are cheaper um, than other solutions because they involve um, less mechanical. This is really pushing um, the realization that um, solar um, on-site generation is a reasonable part of the future. So uh, requiring that you're designing in um, uh, a minimum of 
seven and a half percent of the load in generation. So even if you, um, for some reason, uh, with uh, the process, are not able to pay for that in the initial construction, that you actually seriously design it into the building. Um, you know, it's pretty clear with all the numbers. You know, fossil fuels will continue to go up and down, and generally sort of up in the long, long run. Uh, whereas renewables are going down, and buildings are long-term assets, so it really makes sense to build that into the design. And then also focusing on metering. You know, if you define that all up front, it's much easier, it's much cheaper to get um, good metering, like metering by end use, and then having a program of performance. A big part of this here is um, setting targets in design that also carry through into operations so that we actually know as we operate the building what it's supposed to do and then use that as a guide to um, continuously do commissioning. And we have um, good case studies, good case studies at UC Merced, good case studies at NREL where they're showing that without explicit additional budget, you know, they can achieve targets that are um, at about 50% or lower of business as usual sort of existing building stock energy performance for buildings of similar types. Essentially just by setting those targets for the design team and, and knowing that when you actually hire the design team, you're sort of encouraging the right designers to come into the process. Um, we look at retrofits. Again, a reminder that we are doing a lot of retrofits, like there's some uh, nice condensing boilers that were installed in the last year up at the lab. Um, but we need to be more strategic. Um, we need to have a more effective and scalable technology portfolio, so something that's getting sort of deeper into the energy use of the building. So that's one thing we need to do. We're undergoing a process right now. So this is both a technical exercise in identifying appropriate technologies. Right now I'm focusing on laboratories, wet laboratories. It's a very significant part of the load up at the lab. Many of our buildings are laboratories, and we're... Um, doing uh, the process that involves at the lab. It involves about 10 to 20 people of sitting down, meeting vendors, really investigating the technology, looking at it from a health and safety point of view and many different points of view, and really working out, is this going to be a good technology solution? And we're looking at demand-controlled ventilation, so something that can have a very significant impact on laboratory energy use, and then also um, ways to do more sophisticated oc occupancy. Uh, control, so uh, opportunities to really try to match what the building is providing to what the occupants actually need. Um, you know, I mentioned, um, you know, installing condensing boilers. Uh, facilities departments are good at identifying decent projects, you know, identifying what the payback for that project is going to be, and then, you know, convincing money to be released for it and doing it. And that's, um, that works great if you're just looking at the project level, but it's not a good strategy if you're trying to get out, you know, 10 years and 20 years and have gotten a significant reduction in your portfolio. You know, you could easily sort of take out the low-hanging fruit and then not have a way to finance deeper retrofits and so forth. So um, something that I'm working on um, with um, Gerald Robinson and EETD right now is really putting together a multi-year business model. Um, so something that really looks at how... Um, you know, at a 10, sort of 20-year period, and includes the variables of what energy costs are going to do or what we likely think they're going to do, how regulatory things are going to change, and looking at all of our various um, funding sources, both internal funds and then other, like UESC or ESCO um, outside funds, and sort of putting it together in a strategy that actually makes sense over a 10- and 20-year period. Um, then as we identify these projects, we're going to be piloting some of them and... Um, there's uh, many opportunities um, to uh, get into research here. There's a lot of interesting stuff being done both at the lab and down here on campus about um, sophisticated occupancy sensing. Um, and we're actually talking with EETD right now about um, some work about controlling rooftop air conditioning units and integrating that into the grid. Um, performance monitoring. Um, so this... Um, you can think of as generally energy management, but it also goes into other commodities. It also gets into sort of tracking uh, your performance over time. You know, um, maybe out of necessity, but our, our focus, our approach here is really just to stay focused. <laughs> I don't think um, I'm going to be pursuing doing a big dashboard system across all the buildings at the lab. You know, when you're talking about this multi-year business model, you really have to make sure that you're going to be able to protect energy, any, any energy savings that you create. If it's a new building or if it's a retrofit project, you need to know that you actually got the efficiency and that it's actually going to be here five years and ten years. You need to have feedback for that. So I'm focusing 
um, everything that we're doing right now, you know, sort of at a relatively small scale to make sure we sort of protect the assets that we have now. Um, that can happen at a project level. This was just me uh, looking at some numbers um, of different types of portfolios of buildings and looking at what the utility spend is. You know, it might make sense to have an energy manager for two or three million dollars worth of utilities. And it's, I think, much better to have someone that focuses on that utility bill um, that's more integrated with the science and doesn't sort of overwhelmed by, um, you know, all of the utilities across the entire campus. Uh, again, you know, a similar theme here. There's a research um, opportunity. We've been talking with a group at EET that's been instrumental in really um, developing and deploying ISO 50001. So that's an internationally recognized standard around energy management. And then green grid. So um, uh, we are um, doing planning around expanding, or actually consolidating lease facilities and expanding uh, what the lab is doing at the Richmond Bay campus along with UC Berkeley. Um, it's still in uh, relatively early planning phases, but I think um, it's reasonable to target 100% renewable energy for our office and uh, typical wet lab facilities. And that's a combination of different type of renewables. Um, so on-site renewables is definitely one component. So you know, right now that's just looking at particular opportunities, let's say at Richmond Bay campus, or revisiting opportunities up on the hill because prices are changing a lot. Um, I've been working with Livermore um, Lab on a project that's been going through an RFP process over the last several months. And that's um, just kind of a unique opportunity in which the idea is to develop a solar, a sizable solar project at Livermore um, and then contract it to WAPA, who's the utility provider, Western Area Power Administration, who's the utility provider for the Hill. So it's a way that we as a group can sort of green up our utility provider um, there. So both purchase even though the, the array is at Livermore. Um, there's um, just, it takes con continuous um, effort to identify other ways to access green power. And I think one thing you see in energy markets is that they change a lot every year and everything is, is changing. Um, some neat opportunities at Richmond Bay Campus because their default energy provider is Marin Clean Energy, which is um, managed by Marin. Um, but they've developed a partnership with Richmond. And so it's a way that you can have a 50% or 100% renewable portfolio product um, for um, the same as PG&E or, or one cent more per kilowatt hour at PG&E. And then, again, you know, great research science. We have a lot of people doing grid integration, vehicle to grid work, um, you know, generally smart grid research. And um, I think there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, so, um, half time stretch. We're down, we're through four, four of the initiatives and we just have the last three to go. Um, and then I'll take some questions. Um, that's Howdy, who's here in the audience, uh, modeling a capability which isn't quite yet in place, but should be in a couple weeks. Um, so um, I've been focusing on um, working through all of the barriers, and there are many, um, uh, to allowing uh, a first stage of electrical vehicle readiness. So that is allowing staff to charge their own personal vehicles at, 100, uh, at existing 120 volt outlets, so sort of trickle charging up on the site. Um, so we've been working through all of the de details to put a program in place, which um, we should have in place in a couple weeks. Uh, we've joined with the DOE in a workplace charging challenge, um, which is probably a great venue to work through the many barriers, because um, there are many. Um, but it's a good to have a partner in the DOE. It's a natural partner for us. Um, then we'd sort of work on a level two project, so higher voltage uh, charging. Um, the vehicle to grid people up at the lab uh, have vehicles um, that are coming through a research channel and we're working to make those um, available for staff um, in charging, so a, a faster charging mechanism. And then, but really then, the third part of this is just getting a real plan. You know, California has developed and has developed an electric vehicle readiness plan. Um, I want to know what our plan is for Berkeley Lab, and I don't know what it is yet, but we're going to sort of work on that. So it's going to be gauging what the demand really is as we start charging and figuring out what is the appropriate number of charging, what type of charging can really be used, and so forth. Um, I have a person that works with me, Erin Claybaugh, and she's focusing on uh, people, employee engagement. Um, and the idea here is to really, really focus deeply on, on one thing for a while until you've really made some progress and changed, um, changed institutional practice. So she's, she is starting uh, with closing sash hoods, um, 
laboratory sashes, um, something that uh, human behavior, whether you leave the uh, fume, the, the laboratory sash up or down, uh, changes the energy consumption greatly of the building. You know, that device in general um, is the way that a lot of air gets um, exhausted through a building and gets um, replaced by 100% outside air and generally consumes on average about three and a half, the energy of three and a half homes. Um, so we're focusing sort of not at the corporate level down, but we're really kind of working with groups of people um, to really figure out what the barriers are and work through solutions. Um, and then to sort of build pilots and then sort of expand that up and apply it more generally across the lab. And then we hope to sort of move on to, well, of course, we will move on to other behaviors, assuming um, when we're ready to. Um, so we've talked about other sort of effective um, things to focus on, like maximizing our use of teleconferencing technology, you know, which we're getting a lot more of, but people don't, um, we don't necessarily understand how to use it all yet or when best to use it, um, and then getting into like management of, of energy um, using equipment in your workspace. And then the last, we've been focusing a lot on this in the last couple months. We've rolled out um, a new program two weeks ago, so working at, at waste diversion. There's been a lot of efforts at the lab around um, recycling and composting over the years, but um, currently it's a pretty disjointed program. Uh, there's not a continuous process that goes from person to bins to custodians, you know, to the bins behind the building and to the back of building services. There's um, very significant disjoints in that process. Um, people don't, don't know exactly what to do and, um, and the process doesn't work. So we sort of use that employee engagement approach and we've been working very intensively with a group of um, users in the Earth Sciences Division in a new building, Building 74. We've been working with custodians, with the person that oversees the contract and really work through sort of all the details of a program that has centralized collection stations, um, sort of customizable options for bins that you have in your workspace. People are bringing materials to the centralized bins. And um, it's been fun, honestly. We've come up with like totally different solutions than I would have guessed. Um, and it was just really a group process. And I think we've figured out a lot of details that can be expanded across the lab. And we're looking at the details of doing that. Um, we've also been focusing on um, the cafeteria, um, improving signs. We're going to be composting paper towels like you do in this building here um, very soon up there. And then um, sort of working with zero waste events. It seems like a really good way to communicate with people. We did it at our open house this last year where we had several thousand people up there and something like a 98% diversion from the event. Um, very good. We did it yesterday with a group of students on um, Take Your Children to Work Day. Um, so um, this is another area in which we're focusing. So that's it. Those are the initiatives. Seven initiatives, two areas, three goals. <laughs> that's sort of generally the direction in which we're heading right now. Um, and we do have uh, 10 or 15 minutes or so for questions. So. Oh, questions? Um, just a quick question on the waste diversion. You said that the solutions were totally different than what you expected. What, uh, what were they? Well, um, it all seems so uh, pedestrian at the end of the path. But um, it was just, uh, we identified a, a unique set of bins that I had never been aware of. I thought I sort of knew all the bins that were out there. We ended up getting a, a, cust a fully customizable set of bins that could be used for a regular waste diversion station and can be customized for collecting special wastes in labs. Um, there's been a lot of um, sort of history at the lab about the trade-offs of what is reasonable to expect from individuals and what is reasonable to expect from custodians. And, um, you know, like, should people have to do self-serve? And we sort of worked out a compromise on that in which people are... Um, encouraged and many people do um, bring their waste to the centralized diversion station but there is a basic level of service that's provided on a weekly basis um, things like that we also um, to make um, life more enjoyable for the people that actually are really into the the composting and recycling we sort of allowed them to completely customize what they have from a menu of options underneath their desk 
So instead of having two like annoyingly large recycling and trash bins that are like this big that they just sort of hate, um, they can get rid of their bins and just you know, walk everything up, or they can have a little tray for their recycling, and that's it in their spaces. And there seems to be sort of positive response to that. If you're going to ask people to do something, at least make it so it's, um, they enjoy it more and don't have to look at something they're not really excited about. Things like that. But custodians are really the key. It's working with the custodians. Uh, they are the magic that holds it all together. And, and now we're going to have to focus on making sure the program actually works. And I think that's for a while we're going to put a lot of effort into it. And that's continued communication between the occupants, uh, the custodians, and us, and really identifying the problems that will arise um, and then fixing them. It's not easy. Hi, so thanks for all your hard work. It looks thanks. great. There's um, you know, obviously a lot to do. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess my question was about the, um, re the grid renewables. Um, you, know, you mentioned for new buildings, and I was just wondering what the obstacles for including deployment of you know, the whole site in, in that. Is it just the renewables aren't available on the from the provider we have, or could we buy wind power from WAPA if we wanted to right now, or what the status of things like that is? Um, um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what direction to go to. So are you talking about um, purchasing power from our providers? Is that right? Okay, yeah, so um, there are uh, kind of many barriers to that. So uh, right now we have a, a WAPA um, energy allocation, which is about 20% hydro, and then about 80% just general purchases from the grid. And so um, they um, uh, do not have uh, extensive renewables coming into that, that mix. So um, we are sort of limited to things like this special project right now, which actually could expand a lot. There's a lot of federal land, and people are talking about um, putting renewables on that federal land, and there's a distinct possibility that you could sort of channel it through actors, um, utility market operators like WAPA. Um, uh, there are a lot of barriers right now. Uh, you, can, you can do on-site generation, but there's a lot of barriers to to doing that. We found it at Merced, where we put in a one megawatt array, and we were sort of very close to our total energy production, and we could, we could, we were basically right at the edge of exceeding it. So you can't just put in an array that's going to cover your entire energy use. We could have done that at Merced. It would have been actually cost effective. It would have cost more than the one megawatt array, but we could have put in a five megawatt array, and it still would have been reasonable to do. Um, but that would have overproduced the campus by four megawatts in an interval. And there's no easy off-the-shelf way to um, sell that much power back to the utility. So there's, there's a lot of barriers to putting in large-scale solar as well. So I'm not sure I totally, those are a couple ideas. You can sort of push me if you want more. <laughs> Hi, John. Can you talk a little bit about the EV? So is that an uh, ongoing project or what's the status? The electric vehicles? That? Yes. So the status is um, we're, we're trying uh, Thursday of next week of, um, of collecting names if people want to do it and uh, working towards charging by May 1st. We might be a week or two late, uh, but it's an effort to allow that 120 volt charging very soon within the next couple weeks. And then um, we're at the planning stages right now um, working with um, people in vehicle to grid and EETD to sort of plan out um, a set of five level two stations that would be primarily used for uh, research, you know, interesting research, like how do you have a distributed set of batteries that actually become a grid resource that can ramp up and down. Um, well, you know all about this, but <laughs> can ramp up and down and, uh, and uh, cancel out the variability and the renewable generation. Um, but we're sort of working out ways I'd like to make that available to staff for charging and have them sort of be part of the research as well, which makes sense. You know, it's all about greater penetration. How do you get? So it's natural to have more than one vehicle per charging station. So that's something uh, over this year. Um, and then uh, we have joined this DOE EV charging challenge. So that means that um, over a period of six months, we are to collect data on what the demand actually is and put together more of a plan and then share that publicly and then work on the plan. So. Thank you. 
Hey, um, do you get a lot of pushback from facilities people when you try to say we're going to install, you know, X piece of equipment, it's got this higher maintenance schedule, for instance, like a condensing boiler, and uh, if you get that pushback, how do, you, how do you deal with it, and how do you make sure that even though it might be the harder thing to always have working properly, that they're willing to, you know, have it be installed? Well, everything's in the way that you do it. So certainly any of these things, if you do it in a certain way, you will get pushback. Um, and... Um, but, uh, you know, I, I sort of, uh, I appreciate facilities. At Merced, I was in the facilities department, um, so I, I understand their challenges. So I try to work um, together with what they're doing, and you have to build trust to do all, to do all of these things. Um, you know, you can lay out a whole building performance target approach. We did that at Merced. And, you know, and it really does take, even if you have all the details in place, it takes about three years before everyone trusts each other enough. <laughs> for it actually to work and feel like it's going to keep going. So, you know, you just got to work with people and um, really try to be on the same page, understand what they're thinking about, and build the trust. I think it's the only way to do it. Any last questions? Okay, we'll, we'll give John one final Great. thanks. Thank you. <laughs>